Uh, James going to be with us for the next hour. Here's what I want to do. I want to I want to talk in depthly about some of the coaching candidates uh, as this this hour progresses. Um, but let's start with the spirited uh, text exchange between James Ham and Kenny Caraway last night that involved. What I believe is Kenny's uh, new love here in this upcoming NBA draft. Man, I'm just saying. I'm like, I'm just saying. There, I'm really ready to like move on from this pick, you know, to get a a, a top guy. But I don't know, man. You got a chance to go. You got a chance to to, to draft this guy, and we're talking about Shade and Sharp, uh, the guy quote-unquote, out of Kentucky, even though he never played a minute for Kentucky. Um, but I don't know what he's going to be, but he might have the biggest ceiling of anybody in the draft. Yeah, okay, so I just wanted for, for those on the radio and for those on the Odyssey app, Kenny took a long pause and looked up to the sky before he said that. I thought, I'm thinking, because Paolo, Paolo, yeah, maybe. But Paolo's kind of still. I don't know what Paolo's going to be. I know a lot of people love Jabari, uh, Jabari Smith Jr. I like him too. But Shane and Sharp, when you're talking about a guy that could possibly be Devin Booker, Paul George, I mean, the ceiling's crazy. He might have the, the, the highest ceiling of anybody in the draft. He might. I mean, I, there are some interesting things about him. I mean, you know, he's six six with a seven foot wingspan. Um, he's got big hops. He really, really like started taking huge steps late in his high school career, um, and became. I think he was probably he was right around the number three prospect coming into this year, and then of course he doesn't play, and so that's a problem. Um, there's also some things that have to be worked out when it comes to his eligibility for the draft. It comes down to when he uh, graduated high school, and there's some questions as to whether he graduated high school. It has to be one year from October 19th um, when the 2021-22 the season began, right? So mm-hmm. he had to have already graduated high school before the season, this the season that we're currently in before it began. Uh, yeah, I, I think it, he's intriguing. I'm not going to say that he's not intriguing. Um, more than anything else, I was disappointed that he was working out in a gym with, a uh, with like, uh, walls that weren't textured or painted. That was, that was something that they got under my skin. Like if you're going to do these high level prospect workouts, you can't do like where I see where the strips for the screw holes were, were covered with, with taping mud. Um, James I'm not, isn't kidding. He was very offended. by. I it. was offended. I was offended. Like, you know, orange peel that thing, maybe an imperfect smooth, smack <laughs> some paint on it so we can wash the walls. Like I was, I was more, James uh, grabbed just his like, pool belt and was headed to wherever this workout I was. was. Like. I'm like, where is this kid right now? I need to go there. I'm not, I'm not down with the bare wall. This is ridiculous. It's like he's working out in someone's old garage. I mean, it's just bad. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, it, like I just it, more than anything else, it it comes down to when I I see a tweet from somebody who's a heavy hitter, like mm-hmm. Jonathan Gavoni is a heavy hitter in the the draft world, right? So he's a guy who started Draft Express. Um, he's a guy who fully brought in uh, Mike Schmitz, who's become, in my opinion, the best like on the ground draft expert that there is in the league. Um, him and Sam Vesney are, in my opinion, the two from the athletic uh, are the two best the, of the best when it comes to the draft. And, uh, and so Gavoni, uh, w- if you're going to go out there and you're going to say like in this setting, he looks like the number one pick in the draft. And then I, I watched the same tape that everyone else did. Like, what setting is this where some guy's, like, playing phantom defense yeah. and he's blowing by him and dunking? Like, like let's – like, I text to you. We could make me look like the number one pick in the draft in that setting, and I guarantee you there would be texture on those walls. <laughs> those walls would be painted. Yeah, I just – yeah. <laughs> no, the, the, the drills that he was going through, I mean, it was – absolutely like catered to him to looking good but i'll ask you this james i know team 
workouts are um, different because maybe they're they're making them. You know, they they got two draft prospects who are competing with each other. But like when these teams have pro days, isn't that about what that is? No, I mean I don't think. I, I mean, look, it just depends on who he lands with as an agent and what their thoughts are on the process. If they think he can go top five, he won't work out for anyone from five and down. Mm. If they think he can go top three, he will not work out for the fourth team on the list. That's going to be the way. So what we could have here is a full-fledged Dion Waiters situation Mm. where they mystically bring in this kid and they shelter him from ever working out for anyone. Maybe he'll go and have a couple of dinners with the, the number one and number two and then we'll get to the draft and no one will know who he is. And um, it, it's really an interesting situation because, you know, very seldom have we seen players that just haven't played at all in college that step in and you have to make predictions. And I've talked to you guys about this a bunch of times. We're making predictions off a kid who his junior and senior year of high school were completely impacted and destroyed by COVID. Yeah. Like, like that's it is what it is. Like there just was no way for him to go out and have the same level experience that kids two, three, four years before were getting. And so I think it's uh, it's a risky proposition. I mean, mm-hmm. he's a very talented player. His specs are incredible. He's got that incredible wingspan, too. I mean, that's what you got to love. It's the, you know, the plus five, plus six inch, uh, you know, wingspan to height ratio. Um, and then big hops. And, you know, he, he really improved as a shooter. It's just... How much experience does he have? How much time do you have to put into him? And I've heard people say, like, there's a possibility for him to go all the way up to number one. Mm -hmm. There's also a possibility for him to fall to, like, number seven, eight, nine, ten, because of the mystery and the mystique of him. And um, so, again, I I like what he has as a player. Um, He's probably more of a shooting guard than he is a a small forward. Um, And you you brought up uh, Devin Booker. I would say he has a better chance at being Mikhail Bridges and Devin Booker, but you never know. Like mm. there's, you know, again, it's that length that you're looking at that uh, it just really stands out. Hmm. If we're talking creeping all the way up to the number one pick, this is executives or general managers getting really creative with what they saw, isn't it? Cause there's just, there just can't possibly be enough actual stuff to evaluate from this young man. I mean, you'd be drafting purely on we're going to take a risk because we're going to take a massive risk because we really believe this guy is a game changer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, that's that's where you get into some craziness. And and again, I I think I'm kind of uh, like Sam Vesney. I I was watching something with him. He say he doesn't believe that there's a tier one prospect in this draft. That's interesting. Yeah. and, And so, you know, everyone has a different way of doing tiers. Right. So. Most people, they look at the draft and they start breaking people up into tiers. Um, Sam does a historical tier, you know, so like tier one athletes are very, like they're few and far between. They're, you know, your LeBron is at the top of a tier one. um, But, you know, there are players like, you know, just go back over the last 10 years. You know, Anthony Davis is a clear cut number one pick. No Mm -hmm. questions asked. Um, You can even look, Kate Cunningham is a clear uh, tier one. And you could possibly even squeeze Evan Mobley into that, um, you know, cat. Uh, there, there's been a lot of guys, but at, at the end of the day, they, they don't think that there's one in this one, this draft at all. And to me, that's really intriguing because I, I think Chet Holmgren uh, is one of those players that you, you don't know about him either. Like what he can do, what we saw of him as a high school player was stunning. And all of a sudden he gets to, you know, a real true system in, in, at Gonzaga. And he's just not getting the same opportunity to show all of the things he did. And it always brings me back to like when cousins was at Kentucky, like they just chained him to the basket. They said, you don't get to move. This is it. You're going to be right here. We've got our rim runner and, you know, the Willie Cauley Stein types. We've got our guard that attacks the rim. Um, you know, which again, Calipari always has it's it, either it's, John Wall or it's, uh, you know, Tyreek Evans or it's De'Aaron Fox. Like, just go down the list. There, uh, Derek Rose. It's the same exact type of player. He goes out and he finds specific styles of players. Well, then they get to the pros, and Cousins was the first to show, like, this 
the the ability to handle the ball, the ability to pass, all these things, the ability to shoot. He never shot a three. And hmm. then all of a sudden we start seeing the next generation of it with, again, AD coming out of there and same thing. Pen to the basket, doesn't do anything but, you know, stuff down low. Cat, same thing. And you and then they get to the pros and you're just like, man, these guys are so much better. So I, I think we're going to see that out of Chet too. I think he's going to be so much better at the pro game than he was at the college game. And he was really good at the college game too. So I'm intrigued by him. I'm intrigued by Paolo. I'm, I'm intrigued by... Uh, Jabari Smith Jr. Um, but outside of that, it, it gets uh, a little leery, a little leery. Yeah. So yeah, uh, Terrence brings up Bam out of Bayou. Same thing. He was at Kentucky. No one knew he could pass at all. Mm. De'Aaron Fox will tell you he didn't know he could pass, or he'll even say, "Hey, I've never played with a big man who can pass like Sabonis." Bam is a passer now, but he wasn't when I played with him. Yeah. And so yeah, it really is interesting. Guys who come through you know, true systems versus guys who are allowed to do just about anything and, and everything they want to do. It always comes back to me, uh, Ham, that the, the draft is, is such a crap shoot. There, there are really, there are no sure things or the sure things come. They don't come along as much as people think they do. Right. Like they're once every three, four years, maybe a guy that you're sure you know, you, you draft the number one pick in the draft, you're sure this guy's going to be at some point in his career MVP candidate. Those guys don't come along that often. And that's just skill, skill, skill set alone. We're talking, we're talking about uh, that only not to mention injuries and, and situations and things of that nature. So that's part of the reason why I'm always leery about the whole tanking and working through the draft like you, you got to get some things done in the draft but it's not always just being bad to get the highest spot because it's it's such a crap shoot working through the draft yeah i mean there are so many so many times that the wrong player has been taken high i mean you want to say you know the kings blew it with marvin bagley but i mean how many other number two overall picks have just not been good mm-hmm. like you know darko um you know Derek williams Jabari Parker, like there, there's a ton of them. Uh, Michael Beasley, guys that just, mm. you know, they, they don't pan out. So the number two pick in the draft is often, you know, the scariest one. I mean, people forget that, you know, not only was Greg Oden taken number one and had injuries over Kevin Durant, but who is the guy that the, the Phoenix Suns took a couple of years ago that, I mean, he was out of the league so quick and he was a top, the number one overall pick. It wasn't a good draft. But you go back and look at that draft, and sure enough, there are players in that draft that are, that are great. Anthony um, Bennett. You know, that was Cleveland. Yeah. 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 Oh, Cleveland. it was Cleveland. Okay. Yeah. 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 No. So yeah, just uh, you know, there there are a lot of players that that don't pan out in the top five. Yeah, Patheem should beat number two overall. Oh in front, man. In front of yeah. James Harden. Yeah. In front of uh, number four in number that four. draft was Tyreek. Number seven in that draft, well, number five and number six are. Um, Johnny Flynn and uh, oh, Ricky man. Rubio, but number seven is, you know, Steph Curry. Curry. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Anthony Bennett. There we go. Yeah, so, I mean, it is a, a bit of a crapshoot. You, you have to figure out what it is that you're looking for in a draft, and then you have to hunt for it. I think the biggest thing that we've seen in past years is that the Kings don't always value the right things. And so I would like to see them value some some things like toughness, uh, mm. things mm. like, you know, a dog, you know, a guy who has a personality to be in number one, uh, you know, whether that's a defensive number one or an offensive number one, but a guy who will lead you. Um, those are things that I think we've started to see them value a little bit more with like the Davion and the Tyrese pick, but, you know, not always in the past. Let's uh, Let's kind of stick with that but we'll transition from players to coaches. There are three coaches specifically uh, that Kenny and I have been talking about today um, that I want to, I want to ask you like a more detailed thought on first one is Mike Brown. What's your opinion on just Mike Brown overall, Mike Brown, his coaching career, what he's doing now, the pros, the cons, and then his availability candidacy for this head coaching position. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I've always liked Mike Brown. I think he's he's a good coach. I think he's definitely more on the players' coach side of things. Um, you know, he's always been like like anytime I've been around him because I've covered tons of Warriors over the last you know five or six years. Um, you know, he's he's a guy that I think could step in. He's a, a steady hand, um, and he's young enough and has enough experience that maybe sitting on the bench with Steve Kerr for six seasons did actually help him come through uh, and grow a, a bunch. And when he gets another opportunity, he'll be ready to really seize that opportunity and take somebody to the next level. You just never know because, um, you know, again, when coaches have a track record, you can point to where they, they failed and where they succeeded and you can kind of dig into why it is that that happened but I also like his his successes are with LeBron James, and I mean I think a lot of coaches would be successful. I think David Blatt was successful with. LeBron I'd argue James. he was successful with the Lakers too. Yeah, he coached the, the. I mean, he he the, the the his coaching career I find just so weird. It's mm-hmm. fascinating. He's fired after a sixty-one and twenty-one win season or a 61 and 21 record when LeBron becomes a free agent and Dan Gilbert think this is going to keep LeBron James in Cleveland. He goes to the Lakers. He's 41 and 25. He's fired five games into the next season. And then for reasons known to only him, he takes that horrible job in Cleveland, goes back and winds up coaching them for one singular season and never gets an opportunity to improve that God awful roster. Yeah, I think a lot of times when you're a coach, you keep thinking it's one of 30, it's one of 30, and the next one, I'll do better the next one. Um, That's why I think taking a step back and actually, you know, kind of doing the zoom out thing that he's done right here, where, you know, he's taken a lot of responsibilities off of himself by being the, the number two in Golden State, and... I don't even know what their titles are there. He, he might be the number two, but, you know, you also have Kenny Atkinson on the staff. You've had Luke Walton on the staff who was, you know, again, took over at some point. Like, there's a lot of different guys that have been on that staff, and I think you can learn a lot. You know, if if you're there with the right mindset and you're taking it all in, then, you know, those assistant coaching jobs are, you know, they can be – as valuable or more valuable to your success moving forward than being a head coach somewhere else. And that's where like a guy like Dave Yeager, I think he's doing the right thing by himself right now, not only because of his health, health issues right now, but um, because, you know, after going to Sacramento and, and having some success, but also, you know, getting fired at the end of a 39 win season, um, he's gone and kind of reset himself as uh, Doc Rivers lead assistant and Philly, and I think that's great for him. He's got Doc to learn from. He's got Sam Cassell to learn from. There are a lot of good. You can do a lot by just sitting back and going, "Okay, how do I do this the next time?" So maybe Mike Brown is that guy that comes in, and um, you know, again, he's been in a good system, and he he's been able to find success in the past. Um, it's just you you're not going to have you're not going to have some of the star players that he's had throughout his career. And it's not easy to win in the NBA without star players. And I think a lot of guys understand that. And so is he a guy who can get you to the next level? Is he a guy that can get you to, you know, a championship level? Um, that that might be the case. But is he a guy that can put the structure in place to get you to that point? And I, it seems like it would be a no-brainer to say, of course, he can do that. Well, but has he done that? Has he taken on a bad team that's historically bad? that's missed the playoffs for 16 consecutive seasons. And can he grow, put in a structure, put in a system and build out something over the course of three or four years that is sustainable moving forward? Or is he more of a guy that comes in and can be there with good players and lead good players to do good things? And, you know, those are two totally different coaches. And and I'm not sure that, you know, that he, that we know which one of those he is, um, but for right now, I would say I don't know that he has experience with something like this. I mean, you, one year in Cleveland when the Cleveland Cavaliers are bad, that really doesn't count. You know, that's not feeling it for three or four years and trying to get someone to grow through something. To to your knowledge, though, Ham, like what is 
been the issue if there's any issue with Mike Brown? Has he at least gone on interviews um, in the last, what would you say, about six, seven years? Six years he's been with Golden State, yeah. Has he gone on interviews or has there been any interest? Has, Has he been somebody that really hasn't been interested a lot of those years in being a head coach again or like what, why is he just now popping on the radar as, as a candidate for a job? Yeah, I don't think he's just now popping on the radar. I think people have known that like he probably is looking for another opportunity, but it's got to be the right opportunity. He knows that because he doesn't he he likely doesn't get another one, right? Mm-hmm. If this one doesn't work out, you don't get another one. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's not like the uh, Rick Adelman is the one I always come back to. Like he was so successful in Portland, so successful in Sacramento. People forget how unsuccessful he was in between those two stops with the Golden State Warriors. Mm-hmm. And and then he goes on to have success in, uh, again in Houston and have success, some success in Minnesota. Um, but you, you don't always get that that next opportunity. And, um, you know, I would put him in the, the bank of guys that you almost consider like retreads at this point just because he has had a couple of other opportunities. It's not just a Cleveland thing that we can look at where, you know, he was under LeBron, it's, uh, it's also the, uh, you know, the non-successful times that he had with Cleveland the second time and the, the Lakers job. And I, I don't know, I like, I don't mind him as a candidate at all. I actually think of everyone, he's probably the safest. Mm-hmm. Like if you look at the, the rest of the group, if you want to make sure that you're hitting a, you know, solid base hit and you're not just swinging for the fences and, you're not just doing something to to do something, um, which I think some of the older candidates would be. Um, you know, I, I think he might be the safest bet that you have out of all of these guys. But safest bet doesn't mean that he's going to be the most successful. You know, mm-hmm. right. so do you think they have a going into the interviews this week? Their first round of interviews. Do you think they have a front runner? I don't know. I I mean, I think that, um, you know, I I think that they're intrigued by the, the three non, uh, the three guys who have not been head coaches in the past and Mm -hmm. Charles Lee and Darvin Ham and, and Will Hardy. I think that they're, they're intrigued by those guys just like everyone else is because there's an unknown there. And I think the biggest problem you have is you're gambling on any of them because they have no track record at all. And you could find, you know, again, the next, the next Taylor Jenkins, the next Nick Nurse. I mean, name that assistant that stepped up and just become great, which we're seeing like one after another right now. Well, there's still a bunch of guys who have just not worked out at all and got fired after a year, fired after two years. And you have so much writing on this one. And that's where I I think, you know, maybe I could talk myself into very easily Mike Brown. Uh, Mm -hmm. because, you know, we know how big this one is. Now, I think with some of the other assistants, the other problem is that you're not going to be able to bring in, um, say, a Mike Brown and then then go get a Charles Lee to leave Milwaukee and come in and be a number two. Like, that's not going to happen. Like, this seven, these seven guys, none of them are going to work for each other, as far as I could tell. Now, if you were say you're getting a guy, a guy like Darvin Hammer, you're getting, that's a actually like a Charlie. bit of a relief by the way. Yeah. Cause my worst fear was they've hired uh, Darvin Ham. Yay. Oh yeah. Steve Clifford's the lead assistant. No, that wasn't <laughs> Darvin's call. That was the King's call. <laughs> Steve Clifford is the lead uh, yeah. associate to the head coach assistant. No, I think that's the problem that you're going to run into that, you know, you want to make sure that this is a true coaching search and that, that guy, just like every other head coach in the league, gets to decide who his staff is. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't one or two guys that they're like, hey, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, this guy's going to be on your staff. Um, you know, those are situations that have, that always happen. You know, Bobby Jackson was here in Sacramento through a couple of coaches, and it was always the understanding. Like, you take the job, then um, you can sit down, and if there's you have some sort of crazy personality conflict, then maybe we don't bring Bobby in. Um, but you know, like again, Doug Christie, Rico Hines, those are guys that I think instantly you think, okay, there's a good chance that they're, they, they could be on the staff moving forward. Mm -hmm. And so, 
you know, if you were to do something crazy, like bring in a Will Hardy or bring in, um, you know, Charles Lee, who, who probably has less experience than most of the other guys, um, and then bring in a really, really high level veteran, former head coach, like an Alvin Gentry type, I think that that's probably a really smart thing to do. Like mm. the, whoever is going to take this job, they need carte blanche to go out and bring in their staff. And some of these guys have like a staff in mind because they've been head coaches before, but some of these guys probably need some sort of like push one way. Like, Hey, let's make sure we get you the best possible lead assistant. Someone who has had coaching experience that can help you get through the tough times. It can help you get through if we have some sort of, you know, weird mutiny behind the scenes early in your career because things aren't going well and, and you're so young and all that stuff. Um, so I think that there, there's a possibility here that we do see, I don't think one of the other older coaches brought in, but I, I think there will be another veteran brought in to help out, especially if they go young. Did that um, raise a red flag for you when Gentry was brought in for Luke Walden? Do you remember? Um, no, I mean, first of all, they had a relationship so those two guys were together on Steve Kerr's bench in, in Golden State. So they have a friendship. And, you know, Alvin has said it multiple times that, um, you know, he did not want Luke fired. This is not what he was looking forward to. Um, he was hoping that it Luke... It just would... happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, I mean, there's also, like, you get a guilty conscience with that stuff. And I'll tell you this, too. Like, I, I've brought this story up before, but... The Kings at one point tried to hire Alvin Gentry as their lead assistant under Michael Malone mm -hmm. um, and then told him that they were going to let Michael Malone uh, go 20 games into the season and he would be the head coach. And he was not okay with that. And he called Michael Malone and told him mm -hmm. what they said and what the plan was and, and refused the job. And so, like, Alvin Gentry is an honorable man. You know, he, he did not come here to take over for Luke Walton. He came here with the understanding that maybe there was a possibility. Uh, but at the same time, you know, he was on Luke's staff for a year and 17 games. It wasn't like he came in, you know, three weeks before the season started. And then all of a sudden everyone was like, oh, what's that guy doing over here? You know, he wasn't a late ad. He, he worked the staff for a full year before he became the, the interim coach. Yeah. Well, I want to ask about, um, I don't even know what you would qualify. I won't even tease it. I want to ask you about Mark Jackson when we come back. And I want to ask you about Will Hardy as well. Those are the two other candidates uh, I want to focus on. And we'll do that with James Hamm, our 1320 Kings insider and creator of the Kings Beat. With Dilo and KC return here on Sacramento's number one sports station, ESPN 1320. I need to see what this dog is doing. Guys, I need one second. Sorry. Yep. Oh, man. Oh, man. How was your weekend, man? You still like in chill mode? Like, you don't have to do too much right now? Or I saw well, you got no. a mock draft up. Yeah. I mean, mock drafts take that first one takes like, I don't know, 10, 12 hours. I mean, <laughs> mock, mock drafts are brutal, even at just a top 15. Like your first mocks usually take like a full 30, 30 player mock. Mm. They, they can take you 30, 40 hours because you're looking at all kinds of footage and film and, um, and really like digging in deep. And, you know, I'm someone who does keep an eye on things, but I'm not like watching every single game throughout the entire season. I go back and I do a bunch of film study afterwards. And then, you know, again, I'm someone who looks for, how I compare, like, I look for people's body motion and, you know, height, weight, like their abilities, and I compare them to previous players, right? And that's typically how I, I build out my draft. I, I see players pretty closely. Um, so, again, like, uh, like, go, for, like a guy named, like Tari Eason, right? Um, mm. What is it? LSU, I believe. Uh, Tari Eason. Um, I really like him. I think he looks a lot like uh, Josh Smith to me. Um, but I also could see how he could look a lot like Thomas Robinson. 
And, and so, you know, there's a fine line between those two players, but one of them was really good and a bit squirrely, and one of them was just flat out bad. And, and so, but again, like body style, what they can do, the way they stuff a stat sheet, sheet the way that they, they move, um, you know, their leaping ability, their, their uh, swivel in their hips, all that stuff. Hmm. Swivel in the hips. Yep. Swivel in the hips. Jesse, you all, you all right in there? You a little, a little antsy, a little nervous? <laughs> Jesse said, I feel nothing. <laughs> He's confident. He's confident going for the sweep tonight. <laughs> Yeah, see, I'm going to highlight this one right here. See that? Just watch the shade and sharp video, and I agree with him. Those walls need to be completely <laughs> shameful. Shameful. Oh, man. That's spectacular. Hey, uh, Dane, when we come back, I got a, I got a shout-out we have to give. Okay. And the wind's stay blowing around here. Terrence asks a question about Mike Brown's offensive philosophy. Um, a good coach in yeah. the NBA has all kinds. They can they can handle all kinds of different coaching philosophies because, I mean, when it comes to offense, um, you usually play to the strengths of your players. So when you have LeBron versus when you have Steph, those are two totally different styles. Yeah, and he was more of a... Wow, John won the Most Improved Player Award. What? Interesting. What? Hmm. Over, interesting, like, who were the other candidates? I can't remember. I remember Fox Rick Garland was, was in there. Who? Who? Chris Garland was in there, wasn't oh, he? Oh, yeah. And, uh, See, that's a guy I probably would have given. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. De oh, yeah, DeJounte Murray was the other one. Mm. And where's Jordan Poole in that? And One DeJounte minute. Murray. Yeah, Holy One minute. Shit. Yeah, DeJounte Murray almost posted a triple double on the season. I mean, he averaged over eight eight oh. assists and Oh. Oh, we care about that stuff again. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on a second. We're coming back. Live on the Odyssey app, live on 1320 AM, Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook live as well as Steeler and KC brought to you by McQueen and the Violet Fog, the smoothest gin in the world, handcrafted in Brazil. We're going to get back into some Kings talk and talk about more coaching candidates and all this other stuff, but full stop. The, the shame on us, uh, Damien, that it mm. took us almost the whole show to get here, but it has to happen as we give air horns oh. to our guy. Lee Smith over at the Golden One Center. NBA honored him with the Guest Services Ambassador Award, the Pete, the 2022 Pete Weinmiller Guest Experience Invitation Award. Big ups to him, man. That's More awesome. Reports. Anybody that's ever gone Everybody knows Lee. at the Golden One Center yeah. knows who Lee is. Yep. And uh, I can't imagine somebody anywhere else in the NBA doing it better. Than, than what he does. So no. uh, much, much deserved, man. Big up star guy. Lee. One more arrow for you. Come on. Man. Give us a yeah, that's good stuff. Lee's our guy. Uh big ups to John Morant, who didn't win an award as big as Lee's, but he did win uh NBA's most improved player, uh, which sparked a conversation here during the commercial break. But let's get back to the head coaching candidates for the Sacramento Kings. We'll save Will Hardy for last. That's one I'm really anxious to talk to you about. I want to ask you about Mark Jackson, though. Uh, Kenny and I, and we've actually limited this discussion on the air. I feel like we had a, I feel like we had a pretty extensive conversation during a commercial break and before the show started and kind of felt like, all right, we talked about this a little on Friday. Like maybe we don't need to bring the Mark Jackson conversation back here, but we were just kind of reading some things during a commercial break and, I know this isn't possible and this isn't the way hiring is done, but what is your opinion on Mark Jackson, the basketball coach? Man, that's really tough. 
Um, I, you know what? I, I'll say this. Like, if he was going to be a coach again, I would have liked to have seen it like, I mean, what's he been out of the game? Like eight years? Yeah. About yeah. as long as Mike Brown. Yeah. Or um, maybe the same exact time as Mike Brown. I think longer than Mike Brown. Um, and Mike Brown has at least been an assistant the whole time. Mark Jackson hasn't been been an assistant. You know, yeah. he hasn't been sitting there learning. He he wasn't an assistant for a long time before he got the job the first time. So there's a huge experience gap there. And if all you're going for is um, like a leader of men, like mentality and someone who, who can give the rah-rah speech, I think Mark Jackson might be like a, a good fit. But I'll tell you this very distinctly. When the Kings hired Michael Malone the first time, uh, you know, when they hired Michael Malone, when Vivek took over the team in 2013, right? That was because Vivek was in Golden State as a minority owner for the previous few years and was very clear that he believed, as well as plenty of others, that the X's and O's and the defensive improvements and all of the things that you were seeing on the court that were positive were Michael Malone. They were not Mark Jackson. That Mike... Michael Malone was the best assistant. He was the best lead assistant considered in the NBA at that time. And that's why they went out and got him because they thought he would be a great head coach. And then they weren't patient with him. And that's a whole nother story. But that's my point is that his, we're not sure like, what is he as a basketball coach? Is he a, is he a good coach? Is he an inspirational guy? Uh, or did he, you know, basically luck into a very young and up and coming team and have a really good assistant next to him? And, I, you know, there, there are too many things out there. It can't, this job can't just be about basketball at the end of the day. It can't just be about like an X's and O's thing. No, I, I understand that. I, I yeah. understand that completely. I think my gripe started to become is people like we dismiss the fact I, think Mark Jackson was a good coach. I think there's enough that shows Mark Jackson was a good coach. Like I read something earlier. It was, oh, he t he had a team that had Steph, Clay, Draymond, all of these players on it. It's like, yeah, they weren't Steph, Clay, Draymond, or all those players before Mark Jackson coached the team. Like, let's not pretend like they were a I, I can't remember the exact numbers. We had them earlier. It was like a 27 win team into a 51 win team. Oh. Will Z had the numbers that said they went from 27th in defensive rating to fourth. Like we can't just dismiss that because we don't like the guy. I'm not saying he doesn't have his faults and there aren't problems with him. I'm just asking for people's opinion of him as a head coach, not as a person, not as a, a religious guy, not as anti LGBT, none of that stuff. I'm asking people's opinion as a coach, and I don't feel like people can give it to me. Yeah. yeah, well, and I think that's where I go with the Michael Malone thing. It's that I can't even tell you that those were his, X and, his X's and O's. That the fact that they improved that much, I mean, uh, Michael Malone has gone on to prove to be a very, very good coach that has improved defenses in the past, who has also shown the ability to have a really good offensive team, uh, who's shown the ability to bring along players like Jokic, who was a second round pick, right? And, and, and help turn him into the reigning MVP. Like, I think you can't discredit. And again, this is not hindsight. This isn't like years later. I'm talking about at the moment in 2013, when they hired Michael Malone, they hired him very specifically because they thought that the success of the Golden State Warriors was his and not Mark Jackson's. And I know okay. that because those were the conversations I had at that time. You can go back and Vivek is on the record saying that he believed that that was the guy who was responsible for what happened in Golden State. And that's why they went and got him. That's not fair. Like, that's not fair. Because nobody does that for any... Everybody got assistance. Everybody has assistant coaches that have roles that um, they excel at. Like at the very least, even if all the basketball stuff 
is all on Michael Malone. Mark Jackson doesn't get any credit for allocating that responsibility to him, to a guy that knew better than him and let him do all that. Like, I, 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 I don't, I don't, I don't know how good he is, and I don't think he'd be a good fit just as a big picture for Sacramento. I, I don't, I'm not advocating for him to get this job necessarily, but I, I think people are being really, really unfair. No, they're being lazy. They're not being unfair. They're being lazy because not, yeah. no one's providing reasons as to why he, no one's providing basketball. Oh, this is a terrible idea. Why? Explain to me why he can't coach. Why Tell me why he can't be a head coach. I think that's it, laziness. Why is it so hard for people to just say he's a good coach? He's a good, I don't he's like him. A good coach. I don't like him. I don't, I don't want him here in Sacramento. That's I don't it. think everything else that comes with him meshes or whatever. But you know what? He knows basketball. I can't take that away from him. I just don't think this is the place he needs to be. I don't think that's hard to say. And I'm I, good with that. I get what you're saying, but at the same time, we're talking about a guy who was a head coach for, what, three seasons and, again, did not have any experience as an as an assistant, right? He's a guy who, who got a job, came out of the television booth, got a job, and then went back to the television booth. Like, this isn't 2013. The game has changed remarkably. And, sure, he's been sitting there watching it change, but he hasn't been coaching. He hasn't been part of – the coaching culture, the coaching symposiums, the conversations that coaches have, the training that these guys go through. He didn't do the training before, and he didn't do the training afterwards. And if he is a guy that can stand up and get do the rally cry and get everyone to, to run through a brick wall for him, that's part of coaching. I'm not saying that it's not. But like, I don't think you would have to try to replicate what he had before, which is an incredible lead assistant who did do a ton of the work. And so while I think that there's a possibility that he would be a, a good fit uh, with some teams, I agree with you. I don't think it's Sacramento. Mm -mm. You have to be able to have a, again, a system and a culture that you can put in place. And it's not just a system for winning a certain amount of games. It's a system for developing players, for, uh, from everything from top to bottom. And that's what the Kings have been lacking this whole time. They don't have the basic structure in place. And I'm not going to risk this job in particular on a guy who has not done the job, who didn't do the job before he got a chance, got a chance, got ran out of town. And even though he put up 51 wins and has never gone back to coaching or got another opportunity again, partially because of things that happened then, partially because it kind of the game has moved on from him and to other coaches. And so again, like, well, Mark Jackson has been in the booth this whole time. A guy like Will Hardy has been learning from the greatest coach the game has ever seen in the modern era mm -hmm. in, in Greg Popovich. He has learned not only has he been learning from the greatest coach, He's also been learning from Mike Budenholzer, who was an assistant under Pop for 17 years. He's been learning under James Borrego, under all of the, just like choose all of these coaches that have gone on, the Brett Browns of the world, the, uh, yeah, James Borrego, um, you know, who, Emmy Udoka. How many coaches have come out of that system and gone on to go be successful? Well, Will Hardy's been there working with those guys, having conversations like, when you have a job, the, the one thing you should do is you should know what you know, know what you don't know. And then what you should do is you should try to take in as much information and watch the people that are around you that are good at what they do. And not everybody is good at the same thing. So, you know, when I worked grocery store, I worked with one person who was great at managing the front end of the store and one person that worked their butts off and was able to like clean up the store and get everything stocked and everything. Well, to be good at that job, I need to pull from both of those guys. And that's where I think you look at a guy like Will Hardy. He hasn't just learned from the best. He's learned from the best and all of the branches of that coaching tree. And to me, that's, that's where like Mark Jackson has not done that. He has not learned how to put in a system. Did he play the game? Sure. You know who else played the game? Doug Christie. Doug Christie played the game as well. And for 14 years. So 
Uh, but then, you know, you have to take that to the next level. If you want to be a, a coach that that's going to have success, you can't skip all these steps. That's why we're seeing when times get tough, what's happening to Steve Nash. He got nothing. Yeah. I'll make, I can make the argument he did skip all them steps and he was successful. And once again, I don't think that he should be the Kings head coach. I really don't think that. But I just don't know why it's so difficult to people to say he did a good job in Golden State. And, and yeah. I, 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 there's, always, I there's always something else for somebody to discredit the job that he did. Some of that was brought on by himself. Some of it is things that other successful coaches don't ever have to deal with. And, and the – Two things can be equally true. Once again, I repeat, I don't think he should be the head coach of the Sacramento Kings. This is a terrible situation for for both sides to be a part of. Like, that'd be a terrible marriage. He does not need to be the next head coach of the Sacramento Kings. But he did a good job in Golden State. And that it that's, that, should, that should be good enough. Like, no need to discredit him for what he's not saying you or anybody. I'm just saying just in general, no need to discredit uh, what he achieved in Golden State, he did a good job there. Yeah, okay. let's 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 move on to what because I just <laughs> every time I glance at the chat, it's just clear that people, no one's. I, I and it's the weirdest thing about this profession we have. No one listens. It's because behind the scenes, it was a different story, fam. If you just got here, rewind, like because everyone wants to talk about the behind the scenes stuff when we were specifically trying to talk. We recognize the behind the scenes stuff. We probably know more about the behind the scenes stuff than we're letting on to, 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 to know. That's not what we were talking about, but framing him as a bad coach is, is silly. I want to stick with Will Hardy. You brought him up. Let's talk about him. I talked to a couple of people this weekend about him, James, and, and maybe it's because of, uh, you know, his length of time with the San Antonio Spurs within an organization and kind of how he just ingrained himself. And I've read different things about how he's been able to ascend and be so young, but be in the league so long. It was like they they were transparent. They gave me access like they let me be a part of game planning sessions and film planning sessions. And the the comp, if you will, that came up in two separate conversations was Eric Spolstra. And I know Eric Spolster's got rings and he's got a lot of acclaim. But what I look at Eric Spolster is I look at a guy who's, I think, the second most tenured coach in the league next to Greg Popovich. Like he, he's he been around a long time. He's been with that organization a long time. And when I heard that as a comp, I got pretty excited about it. Yeah, he's a guy that started at the bottom. He came in as an intern out of, uh, out of college as a 22-year-old. Uh, and didn't know if he would get more than the one year and actually didn't expect to get more than one year. Then he was invited to be in the, the film study room and got a job working in the film room there and spent years doing that. Uh, he, I think he coached their summer league team three, uh, three times as a head coach. Look, I think that there's something that, like, we just, how is san antonio so successful mm -hmm. and, and that's it's something it's it's mystical like how are they so successful how do they how does every coach that come out of there almost almost every single one of them finds some sort of success even if it's a guy like brett brown who gets put in the worst situation possible with just a franchise that wants to lose every game and strips down every single thing that he has every you know like he didn't every time they drafted someone they sat him for a year like he didn't even have time to like get these guys on the court and actually work with them so look um it's because there is structure in place and i keep saying that and uh, like you know again pop is a military guy like he runs a really tight ship i watched a um a clip this weekend with will hardy and it was a coaching uh like a coaching symposium where he was on with two other, uh, like one other NBA assistant and one other college coach. And uh, young coaches trying to get into the industry were asking him questions. And it, they, they finally got to him like an hour and 26 minutes into the video that I'm watching. And uh, shout out to Brendan Nunez for sending this my way. And then when they got to him, he talked about himself for a little while, talked about the way that he came up in the business. Um, 
And then he he stopped everything and goes, you know what? But that's not why we sh- we're here. We're, we're here because you guys have questions, and I want to I want to make sure that everyone has a chance to ask questions. And then he started like coaching the entire video, where he's fielding a question and he's taking it, and then he's like, but you know what? I want to go back to this coach. How would you have handled that? Mm-hmm. And so he was able to turn a, a video where people are really talking about themselves and talking about their way to get there and and all that stuff. And he turned it into a conversation where everyone felt involved and inclusive. And I thought to myself, he literally is showing you how to build a culture without even telling you how to build a culture. He told you also how to build a culture, but he was building a culture on this video in front of you. And it was like, okay, this is impressive. And then they asked him things like, hey, what's the biggest thing you learn, you learned from Pop? He said, be honest. Be brutally honest. Tell these guys exactly. If they're not good enough, you need to tell them they're not good enough. If you need them to do this, this, and this, they're not good enough. I, I, like, I, I was so impressed with – I came out of it like I was already really intrigued by him. I came out of it with even a, a bigger appreciation for who and what he can be. Mm-hmm. He might not work out in the first time. I mean, that's that's always a possibility. He's so incredibly young that it's possible that people look at him and go, yeah, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to buy it 100%. But there's also a possibility that you catch lightning in a bottle and he's the guy that, again, takes the spear, the Spurs mentality and brings it to your, your building, builds the culture, doesn't put up with the garbage, shoves all that stuff out to the side and and takes his franchise to the next level um so i'm intrigued i'm intrigued about the x's and o's but i'm really intrigued about the personality and what he can bring to an organization not as a rah-rah guy Mm -hmm. as a guy that demands consistency that demands accountability and uh if he can pull it off uh, he's going to be brilliant well he can be sean mcveigh when you talk about mm. you know being a young guy, mm. just, just having the foresight to be able to do things, it sounds like him. Um, before we get out of here, it sounds like he's just got a PhD around winning basketball and winning formulas. You know, being around it. Would you guys say eleven years in the league? And 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 I think there's virtue in being at every level, right? Like you, you be a coffee boy. And then work your way up to film assistant. Yeah, media jobs. Yeah. Oh, oh, my bad. You said my bad. You said coffee boy. I thought she was talking about talking about a mean. That's that's my bad. That's my, that's, but I think there's there's virtue in seeing winning organizations at every single level and seeing the consistency of how things are done at every level and and why they are successful. I, I, I when you talk about them, uh, I hear a lot of that from him. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about a PhD, but like the highest level PhD that you could possibly get. And it, and again, just look at all the coaches he's worked with there. It's not mm-hmm. just Pop. I mean, Etora Messina, like for years, he mm-hmm. he was there. I mean, like he has worked with some of the greatest coaches in the game. Like he sits there, Mike Budenholzer, all of these guys, and he's learning from all of them. He's taking pieces from all of them. And, uh, you know, not everyone gets that opportunity. And one other thing that the Spurs do, it's a pop thing, which I, I really hadn't heard before. He won't let you promote. This is crazy. He won't let you promote to an, a new position until you have your replacement trained. Mm. Until you find the replacement, train them, and have them up to speed and ready to take on your job. Then you can go to the next level. But until then, no. No. You're going to work that job until you can get someone as good as you were to take that job, and then you get to move up. And, I mean, that's something that, like, the Kings can't even fathom what that means because hmm. there there ain't nobody who's been there longer than two years, like three years. Nobody. And, and that's just, like, you want to build something? That's how you build something. That's how you build a culture. That's how you build character. It's how you build a system that can withstand anything that's how and you if do there's it. anyone who knows something about building it's our man james ham right there <laughs> 1320 kings insider the walls. <laughs> james ham and builder 
of the Kings Beat. Head over to thekingsbeat.com to subscribe to that newsletter. Check out the podcast, all that amazing stuff. You can check 